I no longer know if you have my best interest at heart. I no longer know the person that you have become. I no longer know if you're concerned about our now and future. I no longer know what satisfies you. How do I find healing and improve my life in the midst of an affair, in the midst of unfaithfulness? Let's talk about it. Hello everyone, my name is Tania and welcome back to my channel. Someone said in a quote, I'm not upset that you lied to me. I am upset that from now on, I have to learn to believe you and trust you again. Today, I will talk about how to improve your life in the midst of an affair and the steps to wholeness. I am going to focus on how emotional affairs are gateways to sexual infidelity. I'm going to talk about the signs and how to respond to the whole situation. An affair is a betrayal of trust, a breach of trust in a relationship. A passionate and emotionally intense relationship with someone other than your spouse or partner. The trust has been severed. The soul has suffered trauma. How do we find wholeness in all of this? Affairs can be both physical and emotional. Physical affairs are sexual in nature. A relationship between two people who may engage in various uh, sexual relations. Emotional affairs lack sexual intimacy, but has intense emotional intimacy that can easily evolve into sexual affairs. Now, there is um, sharing of private thoughts and dreams inappropriately in an emotional affair. So these affairs are both threatening to the primary relationship. Listen, there is good news though. Most marriage counselors report that when your marriage is uncaring, cold and distant, or uh, has suffered unfaithfulness, does not mean that your marriage is dead or useless. Couples can rebuild trust and commitment through forgiveness. And when the cheating spouse, ooh, that was judgmental, um, when the deceiving spouse, <laughs> that's kind of rude, Okay, when the offender, the spouse who has stepped out of the marriage shows ongoing interest to turn from their dysfunctional ways, to turn from their unhealthy choices towards the marriage. Now, before we move on, I just want to throw this in. The people who are having that inappropriate emotional relationship and those who want to entertain it, are usually the ones who believe that emotional affairs are harmless. But most marriage experts view an emotional affair as a cheating relationship without the sexual component to it. It's even more difficult to end this type of relationship because of the soul entanglement, the false bond that has been created. It's a false bond because it is outside of the primary union. Everything done that is inappropriate outside the marriage relationship is false. Okay, so let's go through how an emotional affair can be a gateway to sexual infidelity. Again, an emotional affair is when your spouse finds intimacy and emotional connection with another person. This is a deep personal relationship with someone else through investing uh, emotional energy or investing of emotional time with each other. Uh, there is sharing of uh, inappropriate private thoughts and dreams and aspirations. These conversations cannot be discussed with the other spouse. Emotional affairs can easily escalate to sexual ones no matter how much your husband, and I'm talking through a wife perspective, no matter how much your husband would want to avoid it, no matter how committed he is in the marriage and family because of the, the bond that has been created, that false bond that has been created. When the spouse is invested in someone else, they begin to break away from their actual partner. So where are these connections coming from? The connections can come from Facebook. There's a Facebook friend through a coworker of his, a neighbor, 
or an old flame, uh, which is most dangerous, especially when there is no, there was not a good closure between them when they ended the relationship. Believe it or not, these connections can also come through uh, your local church, local church that you attend with your husband, that there's an inappropriate friendship that goes on with a church member. It can also occur at different avenues, venues or avenues such as a grocery store. So how can the emotional affair cross into a physical affair or a sexual one? When there is emotional dependency, which is um, the, your spouse, your husband realizes that, you know what, I have her emotionally, but now I need all of her. I know, it's, it's, it's just sad. At this stage, he will not end this inappropriate exchange because he is addicted to either the person or how the relationship uh, excites him or both. The sad thing is he is dependent. Why? Because it is something new. It is, it is something exotic or forbidden. The relationship or the person excites his whole self. He feels alive again. He feels young again. What it really is, is selfishness. He is looking to uh, satisfy himself outside of the marriage relationship. So it's all what? Selfishness. Now he begins to withdraw from you and the family. This is the alienation stage. The alienation stage manifests when he starts to withdraw himself from the family to fully enjoy what? his selfishness, what satisfies him the most. He will seclude himself and ignore the marriage and the kids if you do have kids. Um, if he used to watch movies with you and the family, now he wants to watch movies all by himself. He will start a whole TV series and watch it by himself. He's wearing his earphones and his AirPods more than he usually would. He just wants to shut off from the whole entire family. Why the alienation stage? Why is he pulling away from you and the kids? Again, if you do have kids, because it is too emotionally exhausting to invest in two relationships at once. Therefore, he can only give his all to one woman at a time. He also may feel guilty, a sense of wrongness when uh, he's around the family. And so uh, he's trying to stay away from the family because uh, he might feel a sense of uh, regret for what he's doing. But the whole thing really is selfishness. Uh, the only thing he's concerned about is making himself feel good. Let's walk through the signs of unfaithfulness and the wisdom keys to wholeness, uh, the steps to healing. In the alienation stage, you may notice the following signs. The phone, the phone, the phone. So many secrets are in these phones. Uh, dig it, where's my phone? Okay, so I, I got my phone. Again, if only these phones could speak, right? Suddenly, the phone is always on silent mode. And these are the signs that you uh, may see. The phone is face down. The password is changed. There is a fight to get that password. He is super anxious when you even uh, make a call with his phone. Try walking away with his phone and see his reaction. More on the phone. He spends more time on his phone into late evenings and late nights. There are strangers in his contact list with code names. He has multiple phones or strange uh, phone apps such as Mr. Number to conceal what he's doing. He now constantly deletes his messages and call logs. He starts to answer his calls outside, uh, outside of the house and different parts of the house alone and has random um, asks like, I gotta go to the store uh, because he wants to make those calls uh, outside of the house. Calls and texts from unknown numbers are coming through. Um, he does not answer his calls when he's out and about 
or he rushes you off the phone when you're talking to him. Social media and other platforms uh, such as private chat rooms. He never had social media and now it's a new interest. Now more than ever, he spends more time on social media and tries to find new ways to connect with others, such as face, uh, Facebook groups or uh, certain portals for deep connections. Private meetings. He makes excuses to be with the other person uh, by going out of his way to work on the same project or be in the same committee. And this can be at church or even at work. He justifies uh, his uh, time spent on the phone or probably working online uh, because they're working on what? On that project. Anyways, there are unexplained visits to the mall, stores, and other outings to meet up. Defensive attitude. He gets angry and defensive when asked about the other woman. There is gaslighting, forcing you to question your thoughts, your memories, and events about that whole situation. He does this so that he can avoid answering your questions or just cover it all up. He might even comment uh, and say this, what do you mean I can't have a friend of the opposite sex? What do you mean I can't have my lady friends that I had before I met you? Grooming. There is a drastic change to his routine and it is not a midlife crisis. He changes his appearance drastically. He's worried about his weight, how he looks. He's worried about what he eats. Now, this person is a meat and potato kind of guy. And he's talking about eating salad constantly and having light soup for dinner. Unfortunately, when your partner is embarking on a new friendship of the opposite sex or engaged in an affair, uh, they are rediscovering themselves and changing their look is all part of this. So he'll start going to the gym or create a gym within the house. He's buying trendy clothes and also even new cologne. My final sign is sex life is non-existent. Now, there are so many signs when someone is being unfaithful. So you guys, you can uh, comment down below and let me know what I have missed. But anyway, sex life is non-existent. There is a huge decline in your sex life. Now, this is not because uh, his manhood equipment has been affected. He has chosen to fulfill his needs elsewhere. He has chosen to satisfy himself with the other woman. And also, I want to add um, this. The satisfaction can also occur through pornography and really go even deep into prostitution or those dark online uh, avenues. Okay, so let's get into the wisdom keys to wholeness. With all of these heart-wrenching signs of unfaithfulness, I know someone out there might be like, listen, I am thinking about my single life. I am thinking about my exit plan uh, because I am better off without this hurt, this pain, this mental torture in this marriage. As I watch you satisfy yourself, as I watch you ignore the family, you might be wondering about the little black book in your mind. Well, you know, let me show you uh, the little black book. Okay, this little black book is, uh, right now is in your mind. You might be like, you know, someone would love to hear from me. Someone would love a call from me. Or maybe you can just uh, use your social media platform to slid in someone's DM. So listen, I know it's a tough situation, but I am going to put this little black book away. This little black book can be in your mindset or even in your contacts. But we are going to put this away because we honor and respect our relationship with God. I will focus on forgiveness and rebuilding the relationship. So how do we rebuild? By the power of forgiveness. 
If you are a person who feels peace to seek hope before you make that life changing decision, then accept that prompting, then accept that uh, direction within you because it's really the power of forgiveness. Um, so you're gonna rebuild the oneness in your marriage by the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean you condone or agree with his toxic behavior. Forgiveness detaches you from his ugly choices, from his foolish desires, and his hurtful decisions. And this is found in James chapter one, verse 14. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own, by their own evil desire and enticed. His choices are not your fault. So first and foremost, forgive yourself from letting the marriage steal and destroy your joy. Forgive yourself from letting the marriage question your worth. Forgive yourself from letting the marriage uh, allow you to be stuck and not pursue your dreams. Forgive yourself from uh, not moving into your dreams because you're worried about his every move. You're worried about uh, his attitude day in and day out. So we're still running through the wisdom keys to wholeness. Okay, this is our path to healing. The power of forgiveness leads you to the power of decision. Is this worth fighting for? Is my marriage worth fighting for? This is worth fighting for because my marriage is important to me. You got to come to that decision, right? This is worth fighting for because my marriage is important to me. Because God's guidance in my life is important to me. Before I let my anger, before I let my emotions make the decision for me, I am going to seek God first. I don't want someone's selfish choices to dictate how I respond to a life decision. Therefore, I will stay true to myself and move with God's direction to restore the marriage, even if I am afraid. Yes, even if I am afraid of the outcome not turning the way I want it to. The most important thing is for me to obey the glimpse of peace, that glimpse of hope from God within me to move forward to restore the marriage. Now, uh, in some instances, God will move people uh, in a different direction. He might move people to separate, uh, to seek safety uh, from the marriage, or to just walk away from the marriage. And um, in those um, decisions, really seek God's direction in that and confirmation uh, from good counsel. In order to rebuild trust and restore the relationship, the offender, the one who has stepped out uh, of the marriage, should be willing to take steps to repentance. And here are the steps. Acknowledgement. They recognize that they have done wrong and take full responsibility for it. They directly apologize and ask for forgiveness. This cannot be assumed. They directly go to their spouse and ask for that forgiveness. Accepting wrongdoing. They are disappointed that the affair has happened. They have true remorse for doing wrong and for the pain and the problems they have caused. Closed door. They have closed the door and committed not to repeat the act again by putting the proper boundaries in place. They have uh, blocked them from their phone, blocked them from social media. They have stopped the private meetings, and so forth. Willing attitude. They have accepted to work on this relationship uh, and they're not acting like it was forced upon them. They're not, they don't have this nonchalant attitude like, why are you making me stay in this relationship? No, they show eagerness with minimal reluctance to work things out. They give you room to trust again. They give you room to process what has happened. Okay, so how do you improve your life in the process of restoring your marriage? 
Number one, the power of recognition. It is important to uh, recognize that something is wrong in the marriage, that your marriage is in trouble. It is important to do this because uh, when you do not acknowledge that something is wrong, you live in denial. When you live in denial, you keep a cycle of pain, of worry, of anxiety in your marriage. When you uh, acknowledge that this is really a hurtful union, a hurtful relationship by either an affair or selfishness or pride or anger, this then exposes the situation. Okay, this is important because it creates room for God to dispose this unhealthy relationship. Number two, seek God's peace. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Now, um, seeking God's peace is really leaning to his instructions, leaning to his direction, letting him teach you how to respond to the whole situation. Now, some people might seek uh, peace from somewhere else. They might seek peace from these apps to spy on your cheating spouse. Listen, those things will not bring you peace. It'll just suck the energy out of you physically and mentally. Even you trying to investigate uh, the whole world to find out, you know, his every move. I know probably even the, the history in his uh, laptop is a gold mine of information, but those are just temporary peacemakers, okay? They'll just suck your energy and drain you physically. So drop the spy apps such as MSpy or Spy Ike, uh, even Ben Verified. Drop that down, remove uh, those apps. Uh, no, just remove it because uh, these will just bring you temporary peace. It'll just uh, cause you to be anxious uh, and nervous and just drain your uh, mental and physical energy. Don't lean to your own understanding. Let God uncover what you can handle. Number three, detachment. According to Mark 10, 8, it says, and the two will become one flesh. Okay, listen to that. And the two will become one flesh, not become one spirit. So detachment is when you detach your spirit from the poisonous behavior, from the unfaithfulness. Okay, you need to detach your spirit from the toxic natural activity that is in your marriage, that is stealing, killing, and destroying your joy. Once you detach your spirit from this unhealthy behavior, then the idolatry of marriage, uh, the, the idolatry of, of the marriage relationship is broken down. You no longer idolize your marriage, idolize your family, idolize your kids, okay? This gives God room to come and work in your marriage. You give God room to act in your marriage, to direct your marriage. You give God room to heal your marriage because you are giving him his rightful place in your heart as your first love. When you're detaching, you're not detaching from the oneness that God has joined you together. So respect your husband, um, uh, honor your husband, and also serve your husband. You're detaching from the foolishness of what's going on in the marriage. Detachment frees you up to pursue your God-given purpose. When you detach your spirit, but still love the oneness, but still respect the oneness, I have to say that, but still honor the oneness and still serve as, uh, as a wife and also a helpmate in your marriage just makes room uh, for you to take opportunities that God has reserved for you because otherwise you'll be afraid to leave him alone. You're afraid that uh, he might be with someone else when you're gone, when you're gone to, uh, to a conference or something like that. You know, so it just gives you room to pursue what God has for you. 
You can pursue your purpose because you're no longer afraid, afraid to move in your life, really. For example, if there's a conference um, outside of your state, you will attend that conference because you're no longer afraid to leave him alone in the house thinking that he might go and see the other woman, right? God will give you peace that he'll handle that situation for you, right? You're not consumed about what he's doing. You're not consumed uh, how he's neglecting the house, how he's neglecting the children. God will give you patience. God will give you peace to know how to handle those situations. When you detach your spirit, you're detaching your spirit from the foolishness of what's going on in your marriage. So you still serve him, you still honor him, and you still respect your husband. Okay, this just gives you room to take the opportunities that God has reserved for you. You know, uh, you're no longer consumed about what he's doing and how he's neglecting the household. All of that will be confronted through counseling and, and also through one-to-ones, let's say. But um, you are uh, detaching yourself from the foolishness of, of his behavior, really. So you are focused on what God has for you, the plan of God in your life, because what we want to do, we want to live on purpose. So what I want you to do is to grab a pen and a paper or a journal and start writing uh, about your dreams. Start writing what excites you. What do you want to become? What do you want to do with your life? How do you want to improve your family or contribute to the world? So in a nutshell, ask God, what is the plan that he has for your life? When you're becoming you, when you're becoming that person that God has intended for you to be, then you are going to care about your environment. You are going to create an environment of comfort, an environment of safety, an environment of peace. This will change the whole mood in your family. It will make everybody relaxed. Okay, you're not going to tolerate the enemy coming in and um, allowing him to cause silent treatment between you and your spouse. You will continue to speak to your spouse even though he doesn't give you much conversation. Um, if there's still sex going on, you're not going to withhold sex from your husband. Some of the tips that I can give you that has been really helpful in my life are these. Make your bed. It invites order and research has shown that. So you want to invite the spirit of order, the spirit of order in your space and in your environment. Keep surfaces clutter free. Clutter signals our brain that our work is never done and it creates guilt and anxiety, a feeling of being overwhelmed. There's so much going on uh, within the family, within the marriage, and lessening that anxiety is the key. Lastly, good counsel. Seek good counsel. Reach out to your local church, a trusted pastor, a deacon, or an elder. Someone you trust who has wisdom about uh, marriage relationships. Seek counseling. Look for a counselor that holds your values. I am going to close with this. Proverbs 16, 3 says, Share your plans with the Lord and you will succeed. What are the plans? What are the desires for your marriage? Commit them to the Lord and they will succeed. Well, I love you guys. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.